I think it's clear that we've made substantial further progress in achieving our inflation goal. Employment is still a bit short of the mark on what I consider to be substantial further progress, but if progress continues as I hope, it may soon meet that mark. This is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. That's why I'm moving forward with vaccination requirements wherever I can. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Fed resignations. Robert Kaplan or Eric Rosengren stepped down within hours of each other after revelations about their stock trading activities while in public office. Army on standby. The UK has a military ready to alleviate its worsening fuel crisis. European gas, carbon and power prices hit record highs. And Olaf Scholz begin coalition talks after claiming victory in Germany's election. His opponent, Armin Laschet, insists a deal will be struck by the end of the year. Now, first thing is first, let's check on the markets because there's quite a lot going on after the repricing of treasuries also led to a repricing in certain asset classes. Again, this could mean a move or a rotation to value stocks. You can see the Euro uh, stock 600 down some 1%. Of course, some of the concerns out there is the uh, price of oil that could filter through some of the medium uh, to short-term expectations for inflation. Also, energy crisis not getting better. It's actually getting worse, and we have a record price for energy in Europe. So the stocks 600 energy gaining 1.9%. You can see we're seeing a little bit of pressure on the S&P futures, but actually it's the Nasdaq futures. I think they're seeing the most brunt as lofty valuations over tech are starting to worry some of the investors. The UK were thinking or talking, the government's thinking actually, about bringing the army to drive some of the trucks that will supply fuel to petrol stations, uh, down some 0.3 percent. The CAC 40 also a bit of an impact on some of the retail. And then you can see the DAX down some 0.7 percent as we're waiting for some kind of coalition building. We know that the SPD and Olaf Schultz is now speaking to the various parties. So as expected, energy on the up after we have energy prices at a record in Europe, auto parts, telecom, the rest down with technology. Again, lofty valuations, a concern as treasuries reprice down some 3 percent. Now, European equity markets sitting lower. That's as Treasury yields climbing with a 10-year topping 1.5 percent, the highest level since June, the two-year hitting an 18-month high as investors price the start of tapering by the Fed. Energy also in focus this morning as prices continue to soar. Brent crude climbing past $80 a barrel for the first time in three years, stoking inflation concerns. So to talk about the markets, let's bring in Virginie Maisonneuve, Global Equity Chief Investment Officer at Allianz Global Investors. Virginie, as always, great to speak to you. When you speak to a lot of investors, they say they're not quite sure what to do with energy prices. They, of course, worry about the, the rotation into value. But all there is to do is to buy stocks. Would you agree? Well, I think <laughs> it's a little bit more complicated than that. But uh, it's good. To, it's good to uh, to see you too. So I think what we're having with this energy crisis is really a problem of calibration, and the calibration is between what's happening with climate, the policies that we're seeing. Second, a change in weather. So you have too much humidity in Colombia, not enough rain in uh, in China, for example, at the time where you have this economic cyclical rebound. And of course, with target emissions, people are trying to use less coal. So what we have is really a calibration issues with long term policies and short term disruption in implementation. All of this can actually be fruitful for stocks. If you're in the right stocks, you can uh, obviously benefit from it with the long-term climate uh, you know, resolution and the short-term uh, energy price moving up. The one lesson, though, I think that's very important is to understand that this calibration is going to be very, very difficult, and, and we must be ready for some volatility. So, Virginie, give us a sense of actually, do you worry more about the repricing in treasuries impacting maybe where you see the reflation trade, or do you actually look for value play? Well, I think, you know, to me, in a portfolio, you want to have a mix of different styles. The value plays will, of course, will benefit from the normalization of monetary policies, as well as those short-term uh, cyclical bonds like the energy uh, prices, potentially financials with rising rates, et cetera, et cetera. 
But to build a portfolio, we don't build a portfolio for six months, right? You have to anchor your portfolio on a long-term basis. And for me, I still like style diversification between growth and value. And of course, as you know, I still like the thematics. Uh, thematics on a long-term basis with climate and other different, uh, you know, sm smart cities and cyber and demographics and future generations and all of this. That to me is really the way to anchor the portfolio for both strategic and structural opportunities. So uh, Virginie, how do you play, for example, the sustainability and the push to ESG, especially with a, a new government in Germany? Do you buy renewable stocks or is there another way of playing it through, for example, maybe some of the cobalt or some of the, the rare earths that are needed to produce these renewables? Yeah, so obviously, you know, you can't, again, diversification is essential. And I think you have to have, need to have a multi-pronged approach to this. You need to have some of the renewables, but of course, we don't buy things at any price and forever, right? You want to have a long-term time horizon. But at the same time, I would say play that long-term change in map and the roadmap uh, to zero, so is the calibration to zero carbon, right? Zero emission. Uh, with, of course, the players, it can be software companies that are enabling uh, measurements or less emissions. It can be producers who are getting better through the ESG, if you want, angle helping companies uh, get better. Uh, at, uh, at their sustainability or their ESG scores. It can be uh, consumer companies, it can be tech companies. So you really like, have to look at it on a holistic basis. The key thing is to use that volatile period to accumulate positions in, in stocks that you like for the long term. Uh, Virginie, one of the other things that we're trying to figure out is of course, you know, what do you see in China and how do you play it? So what's your take on China today? Yeah, so as you know, China is an emerging economy and China is led by the Communist Party. We've known that for many, many years. And uh, China is going, in my view, to this phase three. So phase one was, of course, accession to WTO. Phase two was when China took over Japan after the great financial crisis. And now it's phase three. And phase three is about the path for the next 10 to 20 years. And of course, in the past few decades, China has grown, developing its private market economy, uh, but in a way that has leveraged some of the growth sectors, such as technology, et cetera. And during that time period, there has been some pretty sharp social inequality developing uh, in the country. If you look at the Gini coefficient, for example, you know, this is one way to look at it. And of course, as we are in the hands with the, of the uh, Communist Party, and there's a recalibration again of uh, what uh, the long-term plan is, uh, we have seen some regulations coming in, which by the way, is not so different uh, in terms of the targeted sector, if you look at technology or healthcare or, you know, uh, from, from other countries. So I think China, given the size of the market and the economy today, number one is an asset class. You have to be there. Number two, you need to have a long-term time horizon. And if your position is low in China, or if you have no exposure, this kind of period of volatility and retraction, right, in some of the prices is a very good entry point. And the third thing is that you have to have very good stock picking skills, but you must include the analysis of monetary uh, policies, policy framework, long term changes in dynamics that the country is putting in place to get to its goal of a more prosperous, if you want, common uh, economy for all. Thank you so much, Virginie Maisonneuve, their Global Equity Chief Investment Officer at Allianz Global Investors. Now, coming up, Brent jumps to its highest level in three years amid warnings that the global energy crunch is hitting growth. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News with Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. 
The leader of Germany's centre-left Social Democrats is calling on potential partners to join him in a new government as soon as possible. Olaf Scholz appealed to the Greens and the pro-business Free Democrats to back a three-way coalition. The candidate for Chancellor Angela Merkel's CDU, Armin Laschet, says he'll still try to forge a majority, but a key ally says that can't happen after his second place of finish. Now, the UK has officially put the military on standby to help deliver supplies to petrol stations in an effort to stem a widening crisis. It is the latest emergency measure after supply chain disruptions that have drained petrol pumps and emptied some supermarket shelves. Panic buying has seen fuel supplies run dry at numerous sites around the country. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now we're just getting a little bit of <laughs> breaking news on Armin Laschet. First of all, um, he is stepping down as the North Rhine-Westphalia Premier. So this is according to his spokesperson. He will leave that post. I guess it's sooner than expected, but by hearing more from people on the ground, actually this was pretty much expected. It's just the timeline has been sooner than we thought it would. All right, the other big story, and we've been talking about the move in UK, actually in US 10-year yields um, for the last 24 hours is because we had a huge repricing in the US, which is also leading to more reflation trade, maybe a rotation into value stocks. Here in the UK, the 10-year yield rising to 1% for the first time since March 2020. So there is a move overall in fixed income. Staying with the UK and it's still struggling with fuel shortages amid panic buying at many petrol stations across the country. Now the government is ready to use the army to help fix any supply chain issues. That said, some of the biggest providers in the UK, including BP, Shell and Esso, say they expect demand to ease in the coming days. The hours-long queues at petrol stations beg the question, would this be different if the UK had a bigger stock of electric cars? And is the green transition the answer to even more of our problems? Where our next guest is ahead of a UK renewable technology platform. It gives green energy assets to access to power markets working with the owners of wind turbines and solar panels, buying their energy and selling it onto the UK grid. We're very pleased to be joined by the chief executive of Lime Jump, Catherine Newman. Uh, Catherine, thank you so much for joining us. I have a lot of questions on, first of all, how long do you think the supply crunch and actually this fuel shortage will last? Um, with regards to the fuel shortage, it's difficult to say, obviously, but with regards to the power uh, prices peaking at the moment, so we have record low gas stocks at the moment across the UK and Europe, um, and that's obviously um, forcing you know these, these very high prices along with really low wind. Over the last few weeks, uh, throughout all of September, we've had um, you know record low wind um, on. Uh, with regards to also lots of nuclear has been off, uh, lots of sites have tripped, so it's actually produced really low supply across the UK. So what does that mean in terms of, you know, what you think would help the UK with some of the concerns it's facing? Is it, for example, batteries that could be the solution to this? Is it something else? Well, obviously, we want it to get a little bit windier. And uh, batteries, we'd love uh, more batteries to be stored in the UK. As we, the renewables portfolio grows across the UK. We want more wind. We want more solar. We want more hydro. You're going to need, through periods of you know low sunshine and low wind, you're going to need increased batteries. So at the moment, there's just over a gig of batteries in the UK. That's why, obviously, you store the power when it's at a low price and you discharge it when it's at a high price. Uh, current predictions produced by Bay say in the highest case scenario, we're going to need 10 gigawatts of batteries by 2030. So that's going to be a huge amount of growth that's going to have to occur over the next nine years. And what we're doing at Line Jump is we try and, yeah. you know, help our customers store the energy in these batteries at the right points and then discharge them at the right time to try and keep also the prices down across the UK market. Um, Catherine, do you worry that that's, this will actually lead to also a backlash? And we see a little bit of the signs, maybe from social media, of people that say, well, this crisis has been caused because of renewables, because of the intermittence of some of these renewable power that we use. And what do you tell them? How do you push back against that? I don't think it's because of renewables. You know, it's... Um we don't have as much coal as we used to, which is a good thing. Uh, you know, we have less nuclear. Um, we've got all of our interconnectors across from Europe. Unfortunately, there was a fire at IFA uh, two weeks ago, and, you know, we've lost a gig 
of power now for the rest of the, the winter. That's not going to come back till March next year. Um, you know, gas is at um, an all-time low in terms of supply. It started to increase versus this time uh, last year, but it's nowhere near what it was at this time last year. I think we're at 7.1 BCM flowing at for Russian gas supplies at the moment, and it was twice that amount at this time previously last year. So, you know, gas supplies have dropped substantially. Uh, we used to have a lot more storage for gas within the UK. We don't have that anymore. Obviously, our gas supplies have dwindled in the North Sea as well. So I don't think it's uh, renewables' fault that the fact we're bringing a lot more renewables into the system in the UK is a really positive thing and it's giving us more options to actually keep uh, the supply steady. So uh, given, you know, what you were explaining with the low storage, for example, for gas, is there going to be a global fight on access for gas? Is it the UK versus the EU? How does that pan out? Well, it's, it's really difficult at the moment because obviously um, everybody's watching the weather. We don't know what the weather's going to be like in winter. Uh, JKM out in Asia generally always prices at premium to Europe, so most of the LNG supplies do get diverted there. Uh, so at the moment, that's where the LNG is. But if gas prices continue to soar in the UK, obviously, I and mean, there's a mild winter that starts out in Asia, those LNG supplies will be diverted back to Europe. Uh, but, you know, everyone's watching the, the forecast at the moment. So it depends how that changes. Obviously, people are already starting to withdraw from short gas supplies across the UK and Europe. And if uh, the winter starts to get cold, we could be in a very interesting situation. So do you, can, you, know, do you see this you know, supply crunch actually continuing over the winter months or could it even last longer? Well, let's hope that, you know, we've got um, uh, North Sea Link coming on in Q1. So... Um, once that comes on, we're going to get an additional 1.4 gigawatts of power flowing across from Norway, which will be fantastic. Uh, obviously, Nord Stream 2 is hopefully coming on at the beginning of next year uh, with uh, hopefully some additional supplies there. Weather, let's hope it's mild and uh, we will not need as much uh, power and gas as we, uh, we hope. All right. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Catherine Newman, their chief executive of Lime Jump uh, on, of course, what's happening in the UK. Coming up, we discuss more on what the resignation of two Fed chiefs amid a stock trading scandal mean for the future of U.S. monetary policy. We'll have that shortly. And this is Bloomberg. is still a bit short of the mark on what I consider to be substantial further progress. But if progress continues, as I hope, it may soon meet that mark. I think it's clear that we've made substantial further progress in achieving our inflation goal. There's also been very good progress towards maximum employment. Now, assuming the economy continues to improve, as I anticipate, a moderation in the pace of asset purchases may soon be warranted. Fed officials there with a hawkish message on their taper plans. Now, the common scent yields spiking higher with both the two and five years at levels not seen since 2020. Still, the chair, Jay Powell, will tell lawmakers that progress on jobs remain short uh, or remains short of the central bank's goal later today. Now, there's also changing at the guard at the Fed. Robert Kaplan and Eric Rosengren both quit within hours of each other in the wake of embarrassing disclosures about their trading activities. Now, Kaplan will step down on October 8th, while Rosengren, who cited health concerns leaves at the end of the month. Well, joining us to talk about all of this is Bloomberg's executive economics editor, Simon Kennedy. One Simon Kennedy joining us in the studio. It's extremely exciting. Simon, when you look, first of all, at the two Fed governors leaving, does that actually change the dot plot? Does it change the path that the Fed could take? It could. Um, and so this dot plot, which was much more split than it has been for yeah. months uh, in, in, the, in the last turn, uh, two of those dots move. Right. They're more likely than not to be hawkish, Rosengren and, uh, and Kaplan both hawked. But at the same time, both of them will be replaced on uh, a temporary basis by their deputies. The assumption, therefore, is that um, certainly in the case of Kaplan down in Atlanta, uh, that, 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 that they will still be hawkish. But it certainly throws up a, a chance that in December that those, plot, those dots get shaken up again and it's harder to ascertain uh, what, the, what the Fed's thinking about. And that's therein lies some of the... Uh, uh, doubts over the dot plot, whether it's a real insight into what the uh, the Fed is doing. If you think that on one side, Jay Powell and uh, Alain Brainard are, are perhaps bigger dots than uh, than perhaps other dots. Uh, they are bigger dots, mm. are they? Well, I mean, the market thinks that they're bigger dots. Yeah, so the tradition of the Fed is that, and then 
probably within the regional bank community, there's some resentment that the, the balance of power uh, sits within the Fed board. And if John Williams and Leo Brainard and, um, uh, and Jerome Powell have this, this worldview uh, that's dovish, more dovish, that the assumption is uh, that they are more dovish, um, that, that that's hard to, to kind of skew the dot plot. Interesting, those comments yesterday from Brainard, from Williams, we see Powell today. They all seem to be leaning in a little bit more to that uh, that tapering taking place from November. Yeah, and it's kind of repriced the market, so certainly when it comes to Treasury yields. So are we expecting more? I mean, if you taper sooner, do you also hike rates sooner? Well, they've, they've tried very hard to kind of break this link between the uh, the asset purchase program and the uh, and the rate hike. Um, Powell speaking just last week that's saying, you know, this isn't a runway to higher rates. At the same time, the dot plot moves to 2022. Um, you're going to have people in the market go, well, it did, certainly makes it easy if you've, if you've got your asset purchase program out of the way. Rate hikes are the next uh, next uh, part of that agenda. Simon, thank you so much. Uh, Sammy Kennedy there, our Bloomberg Executive Economics Editor with the very latest on the Fed and repricing in, in yields. Now, the energy crisis in Europe may spell trouble for the rest of the planet. Up next, we discuss the price of power with Jeff Curry from Goldman Sachs. We also speak to the chief executives of SNAM and Octopus Energy on Bloomberg TV, on Twitter and on YouTube. You can also send us your questions on IB Plus TV Go. Coming up shortly, a panel on energy security. This is Bloomberg. I think it's clear that we made substantial further progress in achieving our inflation goal. Employment is still a bit short of the mark on what I consider to be substantial further progress, but if progress continues as I hope, it may soon meet that mark. We could be setting ourselves up for a much stronger, much awaited for fourth quarter. And all of this is, is pushing Treasury yields higher. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacqua, Matt Miller and Keely Lines. Well, it's 10 a.m. here in London, 11 a.m. in Berlin, 5 a.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Tuesday, September 28th. Our top stories today. Investors keep an eye on Treasuries. The five-year rate on U.S. government bonds hits the highest level in more than a year and a half. Meanwhile, the energy crunch sends oil over $80 a barrel. Changes coming to the Federal Reserve, the trading scandal that rocked the two. The central bank now offers a chance to reshape it. And showdown on Capitol Hill, Democrats desperately search for a way to raise the debt limit and avert a crippling default. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Francine Lacroix with Danny Berger in London, Kaylee Lines in New York. Matt Miller is off the week uh, for the week. Kaylee, of course, a lot of the focus on the markets is on the repricing of treasuries. Maybe we're looking at some of the lofty valuations for tech, which explains some of the sell-off we're seeing in Europe and Asia. Yeah, rates definitely the story in Europe and in the U.S. as well. In Asia, of course, the headlines continue to be dominated by the property sector and the ongoing crisis around China Evergrande. Now, in the Asian session overnight, it was a bit mixed. Stocks were lower in South Korea and in Japan. In China, though, they were slightly higher Wait, after another $15.5 billion dollars worth of liquidity injections by the PBOC. And actually, your outperformance came from Hong Kong with the Hang Seng Index up 1.2%. That was led by the property sector. A basket of those stocks up actually 3% in the overnight session after the PBOC said it would continue to safeguard the healthy development of the property sector within China. So that adding to a little bit of optimism, as is the fact that aside from Evergrande, Sunak China, another property developer has been in focus. There were reports that it had asked the local government for help. And then the company said, no, that isn't true, denying that. And as a result, the stock up about 15 percent overnight. I would point to iron ore, though, giving back some of the gains from yesterday. Futures down 5 percent in Singapore, trading around one hundred and twelve dollars. And then your South Korean won the big underperformer in Asian FX at its weakest against the dollar going all the way back to September 2020 on broad based dollar strength today. Now, as for some other U.S. assets other than the U.S. dollar, of course, it does continue to be dominated by the rate story. That's why we saw big tech underperforming hard yesterday, given its rich valuations generally. And once again, that does look like it will be the case today with NASDAQ 100 futures down 1.3 percent at this point in time. We're continuing to see yields climbing higher on the long end of about five basis points on the U.S. 10-year Treasury yield. We're at 153, which is the highest going back to June. But on the two-year yield, the shorter end of the curve, which is, of course, controlled by the Fed, 
It is at its highest since March of 2020. That two year yield sitting at 31 basis points. And then finally, we have to talk the energy story. We're seeing oil gaining for a six day in a row. WTI crude now north of $76 a barrel at its highest going all the way back to October of 2018. Danny. Kaylee, it really is a day where we throw anything idiosyncratic out the window. In Europe, it's very much so the same story that you were describing. It's about those high energy prices and high yields really weighing on these markets. It is an ugly day. And two hours into the cash equity trading here in Europe, it continues to get more ugly. We have the CAC down more than 1%. Spain almost down 1% as well. Really, the only outperformer is the FTSE 100. That's down just three-tenths of a percent. That's not necessarily because the picture is brighter for them. It's just a weaker pound with a stronger dollar some of that currency effect helping those big multinationals but it is red across the board and the only sector that is on the move higher today is energy that's the second one I have here up more than one percent and it is because of these high skyrocketing prices in the energy complex I have UK nat gas futures here this is at a record up 10 percent over more than 200 it's not just nat gas in the UK it's Dutch futures it's German energy it really is across the space it's carbon pricing all of that hitting new records really impacting the sector now on the other downside of things you have gilt yields hitting one percent for the first time since March 2020. It was this move that originally kicked off that move higher in U.S. yields. And without this abating, the U.S. story is likely to continue as well. Because of that, tech is underperforming in the U.S., also underperforming in Europe. This is the worst performing sector today, down more than 3%, Francine. Danny, Bloomberg's latest COVID-19 resilience ranking is also out. Two European nations dominate the top of the ranking for a third month. Now, there's a new number one, Ireland, at the top of the survey. While the previous number one, Norway, fell to 10th, Ireland has been steadily moving up since the start of 2021 when it had the worst outbreak in the world. Now, over 90% of Irish adults have been vaccinated. Canada actually posting the biggest gain, moving up 14 spots to number nine. Singapore suffered the biggest drop, down 11 spots to number 19. Meanwhile, the Delta variant has left the U.S. reeling. It fell three spots this month to number 20. I have to say, Kaylee, it's a, an interesting metric because it's not only about mm -hmm. vaccinations. It's also, for example, the flight capacity, how much the lockdown severity is. And it just shows that, you know, in one or two months, things can change pretty quickly for a country. Yeah, well, to that point, Francine, I was supposed to go to Ireland back in July. I don't know if you remember this, and we still weren't allowed in, even though technically we would have been vaccinated tourists because the country was so strict with its virus mitigating measures because of how bad the outbreak was in 2021. But that looks like it did yeah. pay off for Ireland, and maybe now I should go, considering it's number one in our ranking. <laughs> There you go. Well, you got to actually Greece before me, even I though did. I was double vaccinate. So it's amazing <laughs> how these countries decide to deal with uh, vaccinated tourists differently. Now, a look at what's ahead today. 2021 OPEC World Oil Outlook will be launched at 8.30 a.m. New York time via video conference in Vienna. 10 a.m. New York time, the U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen and the Fed Chair Jay Powell testify at the Senate Banking Committee hearing. ECB President Christine Lagarde also debates at the ECB Forum on Central Banking. Executive Board members Isabel Schneider and Fabio Panetta will chair sessions. Then China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi will talk with EU's top diplomat Joseph Borrell via a video conference. The two sides will discuss China-EU relations, cooperation and international and regional issues. So it's all about the energy sector today. Brent oil soaring above $80 a barrel as a global energy crunch continues. Prices rising to a sixth consecutive day to the highest since October 2018. Our expert, resident expert Will Kennedy, executive editor for Energy and Commodities, is still here. Will, thank you for coming on. I mean, this just gets worse and worse. When does it get better? <laughs> uh, which bit? I think that the general energy crunch is here for the foreseeable future. I mean, I think you heard Jeff Curry say that at this stage, uh, the real question about how bad it gets is how cold it is this winter. And if we have a cold winter, there are really big risks across the energy complex. Natural gas prices are already at a record in Europe. They could go much, much higher. The global supply of coal is really stretched and prices are near a record. And we've got crude at 80. That's less impacted, but there will be some switching away from gas and into crude. So if we get a cold weather across the Northern Hemisphere, it could be very difficult. If it's a warmer than expected uh, mild winter, then some of these uh, 
rallies may unwind a little bit. So right. I think the weather's a key question. But that's sort of the demand side, right? Whether weather picks up or not. What about the supply side? Can that work itself off, especially with the very off-sided underinvestment in the sector? I think the supply side, as you say, is absolutely key. And I think those are longer term issues to do with uh, the crash we saw in the middle of the last decade, which slowed investment. And then uh, what we're seeing with climate investment pressure not to invest in oil and gas. And we've also seen uh, demand surge as we've come out of the pandemic. So you've got this mismatch between supply, which is constrained, and as you say, probably constrained for the medium term at least, um, and demand, which is uh, roaring back. And at the moment, it's a very bullish mixture. Thank you so much, our Will Kennedy there, Executive Editor for Energy and Commodities. I mean, we talk about the global energy crunch, and then, of course, here in the UK, they're talking about bringing the military in to drive the trucks to make sure that the fuel gets from, you know, place A to B, which is our petrol station. Yeah, it's so fascinating listening to Will talk about this underinvestment because it's part of the UK story, too, right? I was just speaking with the Randstad UK CEO who does a lot of hiring, uh, basically saying that there's been this underinvestment in skills. So everywhere you look, it's the worst-case scenario brought on by the pandemic, but it really is that. It, more investment needs to be put in, whether it's the skill of workers or building up refineries or, you know, getting the wind capacity that we need. Yeah, and we spoke to Jeff Curry, who said, look, this is a problem that we're having overall across the board, not only in the energy space. Now, two regional Fed presidents are retiring following revelations of stock trading last year. This means an unexpected number of top monetary policy jobs are coming up for grabs. Let's get more with Ritka Gupta. Ritka, I mean, this was a surprise. I don't know how it changes the composition of the Fed. Yeah, Francine, it was interesting because we got a double whammy of this yesterday. First, it was Eric Rosengren and then Robert Kaplan announcing their retirements, of course, amid that trading scandal. So it was embarrassing for the Fed, but it's unlikely to change policy in the short term because we know Fed Chair Jerome Powell has said he's all but set, really, to announce that tapering in November. But where we could see some changes are more in the long term. Some people are saying this is an opportunity for the board to have a more transparent and more open process of electing these governors. It could have some more diversity here to the board and also in terms of policy going forward as well. We know that six of the top jobs are going to be up for grabs. We know Robert Kaplan, Eric Rosengren, moderately hawkish, could be the be replaced by some more dovish members. And of course, we know Fed Chair Jerome Powell, his term set to end in February. We know President Biden still mulling that decision of whether to keep him on or not. And Ritika, there's still plenty of opportunity for there to be more headlines coming from the Fed. We have Chairman Jer Jay Powell and Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen testifying to Congress today. What do we expect them to say, specifically Powell, about the economic progress? Yeah, Danny, we're expecting Jay Powell to see that those price pressures and those labor shortages that we've seen are more enduring than previously anticipated, but that the economy is still going from strength to strength. In pre-release comments, what he had to say on inflation is that he does still believe that it will be transitory. Uh, but of course, if it isn't and it's persistent that the Fed will step in, step in, will act, will raise rates. So it really speaks to this nervousness that we are seeing now with more central bankers around these global issues, whether there is those supply chain bottlenecks, a rising price pressures or labor shortages as well, Danny. Ritika, thank you so much. Ritika Gupta there with the very latest on the Fed. Now over to Washington, pressure mounting on congressional Democrats to raise the debt limit and avert a crippling default. Now Senate Republicans have blocked a bill that would suspend the debt ceiling to late 2022 and keep the government operating past the end of the fiscal year, two days from now. Joe Matthew, Bloomberg Washington correspondent, joins us from D.C. I mean, if we're talking about a showdown. Does it get resolved or how messy could it be? Well, we're going to find out how messy there's a great potential for a mess here when you start dancing on the edge like this. A lot of different things can happen, but Democrats, to be clear, have promised all through this process to make good on handling government funding. That's the deadline coming up this week and handling the debt ceiling to avert uh, what could be a potential default here. But look, we talked about this a week ago today. That's when we learned that the Democrats would attach this suspension of the debt ceiling to a government funding bill that failed last night because Republicans, we already knew, were not going to vote for it. So an entire week has just been lost here as Democrats stare down a series of deadlines to pass President Biden's economic agenda. In just the next two to three days, they have to handle infrastructure as they promised to moderates in the House, and they have to prove to progressives that there's a framework for this $3.5 trillion reconciliation bill, likely not going to be 
uh, just uh, quite that high, maybe one and a half trillion by the time they're done. But this is a stare down still today between moderate Democrats and progressives to get all of this done. It's likely, yeah. by the way, that Democrats will handle the debt ceiling later on and, and do a clean government funding bill between now and Thursday. If it's a stare down, Joe, someone is going to have to blink first. Separately, what I know a lot of our viewers here in the New York, New Jersey area, as well as other high tax states care about is the SALT deduction. How yeah. close are we to an agreement on that? Well, you know, it's interesting. We hadn't heard a lot about it until just last night. It appears that there will be a last minute move on this for a likely two year repeal to this SALT deduction. This is a big, important opportunity to get moderates on board with the reconciliation bill. They have made clear moderates like Tom Swazi uh, from New York and others from New Jersey like Josh Gottheimer who say no salt, no dice. This is part of the stare down here as they also try to get a number that's rich enough for progressives to vote on that reconciliation bill. No one right now knows if they have the votes and that includes Speaker Pelosi. A lot of work yet to be done. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Joe Matthew. And of course, you can listen to Joe every weekday on his radio program, Sound On. That's at 5 p.m. Eastern time on Bloomberg Radio. Now let's get back to the markets and take a quick check on some stocks moving in pre-market trading here in the U.S. One of the big ones to the upside is Scientific Games. And this is after it said it will sell its online sports betting business, OpenBet, to Endeavor for $1.2 billion. Endeavor really trying to get into that market and Scientific Games reaping some reward from that deal. Those shares up 3.7% before the bell. Another stock moving to the upside is Ford. And this is on news we got overnight that the automaker and SK uh, out of uh, South Korea will be spending 11.5%. Four billion dollars on new manufacturing facilities and a factory in Tennessee and Kentucky, really trying to build up capacity for that electric F series pickup truck. As a result, the stock is up 2.6% on its biggest investment ever. To the downside, though, a lot of chip stocks are under pressure in pre market trading. This is part of that tech under pressure generally due to higher yields, one of them being applied materials. And it's a bit of a double whammy for this stock because it was also cut to neutral over at uh, New Research, the company getting uh, 140 price dollars. A uh, price target from that analyst right now it's trading at one hundred and thirty eight dollars a share in early hours down about three point three percent before the bell frenzy. Kaylee, thank you so much. Uh, also under pressure, some of these uh, semiconductors and chip makers here in Europe, again, because of Treasury yield repricing. Coming up, uh, Patrick Armstrong, Plurimi Wealth Chief Investment Officer. And then a little bit later, we also speak with Leslie Vinjamuri, Chatham House Head of U.S. and the Americas Program. We'll talk about the debt ceiling. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger alongside Francine Lacroix in London and Kaylee Lyons in New York. And Kaylee, Fran, the moves today dominated by the spike we've seen in Treasury yields. Yes, it's been really in the belly of the curve, but I'm concentrating on the tenure, specifically something that would make Tom Keene proud. That is the rate of change. And I just want to welcome our radio listeners as well. I'll describe to you the chart I have in front of me because obviously you can't see it. So I have charted here a nice histogram of five day net moves on the U.S. 10-year yield. Now, what we've seen recently is a move up over the past five days of about 21 basis points. And it's been extreme in terms of the regard it's had on market impact. We've seen tech sell off. We've seen concerns throughout the curve. But if you look back over the past five years, there have been about a dozen instances where this has happened, where we've had a move of more than 20 basis points. So the question is, is, is it th different this time and should we care? To get a better idea of that, let's bring in our Bloomberg M Live editor, Noor Al Ali. Noor, thanks so much for joining us today. So, is it different this time? Should we care about this move in the 10 year? Well, realistically, what we're seeing here really is a reaction to the, you know, the hawkish pivot that we've seen from central bankers along the, you know, since last week from the BOE, and that was triggered by the move in guilt. I'm not so sure if it's so sticky, but I mean, you're looking at here macro market traders expectations here of what they think the future holds from central bankers and right now they're expecting a very hawkish tilt. I mean a hawkish to the point where maybe we start talking about interest rate hikes which is the one thing that central banks didn't want right they've always tried to make that divorce between you know first we taper and then we hike. Yeah absolutely but then you had the BOE last week come out <laughs> and say you know what you know if if the market wills it then we might actually hike rates even before we're done with our bond purchasing programs 
So that just shows you that maybe the economy is recovering so much so that the Fed comes out and says, yep, we agree. And maybe that's what the bond market is trying to signal, Nora. Are we going to continue to see an equity market taking its cues from the bond market? Well, realistically, the correlation here with the 10-year hasn't been as strong. Yes, it has been positive since September, but realistically, the moves there might be triggered a little bit more, I would say, from China as well with the power outages there because much of these tech companies actually rely on factories and their Chinese output. And now with factories rationing their output there, especially when it comes to power, I think that's a little bit more concerning just on the short term, though. Well, Nora, speaking of energy, we were just talking on Bloomberg Radio a little bit earlier about this move and yields and you in some way linked it to energy how do those two pieces fit together well realistically the way I see it going that you know you've got a when you look at energy right now and what's happening there, it's a very risky environment. But the short term here move is that a lot of the traders are expecting gas prices and carbon and power to subsidize coming into the winter and coming out of that. And it is a point of rationing here and policymakers coming into that. Yield traders, however, and bond traders are a lot more macro. They look at these moves and they look at more of a trend towards the end of the year. So that might not be phasing them as much as possible, which is why we've seen a divergence in, in the trades. Nora, I had a pretty feisty conversation with Jeff Curry of Goldman Sachs, and he says, look, this is not a problem for energy. This is a problem across the world. He said this is underinvestment, chronic underinvestment since 2008 across the, the, you know, the old economies across the world. Could we be looking at stagflation so that, you know, this underinvestment leads to high rampant inflation, but we're not growing to keep up? Well, realistically, what you've got here, and this is why the, the climate conference that's coming up is really important here, is that you have a situation where we haven't really been paying as much attention to that old economy kind of setup, but we've, we're also just starting to focus on the green energy aspect there. So you have France, for instance, they're turning into their nuclear energy as reserves, but Germany that's been lagging, they're turning at coal right now. So you can see that disparity when it comes to European uh, restrictions there and, and focus there. So I'm, I'm very interested in seeing what the conference comes up with because this is the time for these markets to come out and these countries to come out and policymakers and say, okay, we need to pay attention. Nora, thank you so much. As always, Nora Awali there from our MLive team. For more analysis, market analysis, check out MLIV Go on your Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg. This year, Bloomberg First Word News and Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has refused to return phone calls from the beleaguered head of the International Monetary Fund since the scandal broke. It's a sign that the Biden administration's withholding of support for Kristalina Georgieva goes beyond its public statements. Earlier this month, Georgieva was accused of improperly intervening in a World Bank report in her prior job there. Bloomberg has also learned that Hong Kong's central bank has asked lenders to report their exposure to struggling developer China Evergrande. There's concern over potential systemic risks to the region's financial system. While markets are bracing for Evergrande to possibly collapse, the company has more than $300 billion in liabilities. Coming up, we talk about the markets and China with Patrick Armstrong of Plurimi. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix with Danny Berger in London, Kelly Lines in New York. Matt Miller off this week. Uh, Danny, of course, all of the focus is on the markets, on the repricing with Treasury yields and on this supply crunch that instead of getting better is getting worse. Exactly. And all of that translating into higher yields in this market. Remarkable to see the move your 10 year above 1.5. Uh, you have the short end of the curve, really the belly of the curve, having that big chunky move. If anything, Francine, it's a little bit of red meat for the bond vigilantes. You had Powell also saying yesterday that should the inflation picture get out of hand, they're ready to step into the market. It. You have that combined with energy threatening inflation as well. And all of this is leading to a situation where it's a feedback loop and yields move higher and tech 
sells off. Yeah, I was going to say, a tech really under quite a lot of pressure, Kaylee. Yeah, you're absolutely seeing that both in Europe and in the U.S. In Europe, the stock 600 is lower now by about 1.2 percent, but it is energy that is the big under or outperformer of that reflation trade that Danny was talking about, while tech is the big underperformer. The tech sector down about 3 percent at this point in the European session. And here in the U.S., of course, it was the NASDAQ 100 that underperformed yesterday. And once again, it does look like that will be the case today with NASDAQ 100 futures down by 1.2 percent. That is as we continue to see yields climbing higher now for a fourth day. We're up another four basis points or so on the U.S. 10-year Treasury yield, right around 152. We have moved 23 basis points to the upside in just four days. It is the rate of change that Danny was talking about that is really significant here. And then, of course, we have to continue to keep an eye on oil as well, higher for a six-day Brent crude is back above $80 a barrel at the highest since back in October of 2018. And no surprise if oil prices are moving higher, energy stocks usually are as well, and that does look like it's the case, judging uh, from pre-market trading. The energy select sector spider ETF up about 1.3% before the bell, and you have other oil names like Occidental Petroleum, Devon Energy, Marathon Oil, all moving to the upside by between 1.5% and 2.5%, Danny. Kaylee, apologies for sounding like a broken record, but I'm going to stay on this topic and talk about this rotation we're seeing underneath the surface because you hit it so well. All of those energy stocks moving to the upside. At the same time, we have yields pressuring tech turns into a very large outperformance of the, for the cyclical sector. So I have a chart here with me. I want to welcome our radio listeners. Let me describe to you the chart that I'm looking at. It essentially looks at one day performance of the Russell 2000 versus the NASDAQ 100. And that trade has come under a lot of pressure just in the past day. We saw the Russell 2000 outperform by more than two percentage points yesterday, uh, really owing to those factors which you laid out, Kaylee. That is the most extreme divergence between performance since March of this year. Of course, it's not just the higher yield story, which means tech, that long duration trade is getting thrown out the window. It's the preference right now for energy as we have those crunches in terms of supply. So as we see this rotation go on, a lot of people who favor cyclicals like JP Morgan, say continue to buy the dip, jump into this sector because it really is the more economically sensitive sectors that are going to outperform from here on out, Francine. Yeah, the, I mean, the trillion dollar question of the day and the coming week. So joining us to talk about all of this and this rotation, possibly into value stocks, Patrick Armstrong, Chief Investment Officer at Plurimi. Well, Patrick, what we're seeing in yields into some of the stocks and the sell-off in tech, is it the beginning of something, you know, bigger and deeper? I think it's going to be an extended rise in 10-year yields uh, for the coming months. I don't think there's going to be a taper tantrum. There's ample liquidity out there, and Powell has really spoon-fed the market of uh, the sequencing that's going to occur. So no one should be surprised by the tapering. But you've got 10-year inflation swaps at 2.3 percent. You've got a 10-year yield at 1.5 percent. Um, that's a negative 0.7 real yield on uh, on that basis anyway. So you're not being compensated for expected inflation by owning a treasury. And I think that gap's going to have to narrow. Either inflation expectations will fall, which I don't expect, or 10-year yields will rise. You'll have to incentivize new investors to take the place as a purchaser of these treasuries going forward. So what are you buying right now? And actually, is there a concern that, that liquidity will, you know, will be on the move? Um, liquidity is still abundant. Um, if you look at the Fed's uh, reverse repo last Thursday, 1.3 trillion, it was a record ever. There's still trillions of cash on the sidelines. Um, so I'm not worried about liquidity. I think real yields are starting not to move positive, but less negative. Um, I, I prefer cyclical equities. I think um, multiples of the highest growth stocks come under pressure as yields rise. I think the economy is still growing. It's slowing. It's not a, an easy call that there's going to be a massive expansion the way it was in the spring. Uh, you look at PMIs, they are rolling over. Um, you've got much slower growth out of China probably now going forward with the regulations and the common prosperity there. But I do think uh, incrementally the economy will keep moving forward. Um, cyclical companies aren't expensive and you have to choose. You're either going to take cyclical risk Mm -hmm. or valuation risk, and I prefer cyclical risk right now. Well, within the cycl cyclicals, Patrick, obviously we've seen some pretty remarkable moves in the commodity complex as well. Do you favor energy or materials here? Um, I wish I would be more overweight energy. I'm a, more overweight of the materials that actually haven't uh, performed as well as the energy stocks right now, but I, I do think there will be a pickup. I think uh, 
The logistics makes good sense to me. Owning broad-based commodities makes sense to me as well right now. And the banks, if you do have a steeper yield curve, they'll benefit from the improving economy and an interest rate margin that they've really not been able to achieve going forward. So all of those would fall into, I suppose, traditional value sectors. So I would have a preference for value stocks right now over growth. And I know, Patrick, you've had a preference for some time for the companies that make products in shortage, the likes of them, semiconductors, for example, given the chip shortage that is out there. But we're actually seeing semis underperforming today because they also happen to be pretty richly valued, which is problematic when you have higher yields. So I'm wondering how you think about that. Yeah, so um, I'm an owner of ASML, Tokyo Electron, LAM Research, all of those stocks i think they've got pricing power for the next two years that uh, there's a clamoring for chips from all industries uh, this chip producers are going to have to invest in new equipment to keep up with demand and once you get the demand matching supply companies are going to want to hoard chips so they don't face this crisis again you can see human behavior right now in the uk at fuel pumps worrying about hoarding things that they maybe not even need right now and that's what whenever there's a supply disruption of something it doesn't just lead to the, you have to offset the demand, you have to offset the potential hoarding as well. So they're getting a dip right now on multiple concerns, but I think they'll grow their way into those multiples. Patrick, I just want to bring our viewers and listeners some breaking news related to China. Evergrande creditors uh, are said to claim that Evergrande is on the hook for a bond due Sunday. This is a $260 million a jumbo fortune enterprises dollar bond that will mature on October 3rd. Of course, we still don't have clarity on whether or not Evergrande paid its dollar bond payment due last Thursday. There is another one due tomorrow, and now apparently they are on the hook for this dollar bond maturing on October 3rd. Patrick, as we think about the Evergrande issue in China, how does that affect your investment thesis, given how heavy a weighting China and the property sector specifically has? Yeah, I've really changed my views on China. So coming into the year, I was very bullish on Chinese growth and uh, the policies the government have put in place and uh, the Evergrande issues we're facing right now. It, Growth in China is definitely curtailed. I don't think it's going to roll over into anything close to a recession, but uh, the policies being put in place, much more regulation on property lending, fixed fa capital formation in China has been an important driver of growth. There's questions around all of those things right now. So I think the Chinese economy is going to continue. The demand side of things will continue to be relatively strong, mm -hmm. but there are risks uh, to the Chinese growth. and. Uh, the government's deliberately putting them in place in some instances, moving towards carbon neutral, things like that. All of them have very good long-term consequences, but they all are short-term right. hits to growth. Well, to that risk you cited in terms of growth being curtailed, uh, Savita Sabramian over at Bank of America has said that the pursuit of common prosperity in China plus lower growth means that there's less growth and less prosperity for U.S. multinational companies. Do you also see risk that growth and the potential of growth for big U.S. companies also falls with that of China's? Um, well, China's an incremental demand for almost every multinational company. So anytime uh, there is any rollover in Chinese growth, it impacts everything. But at the margin, I don't think it's going to be a massive change. Uh, I think supply issues are much bigger in the quarters to come rather than demand issues coming out of China. Um, you've probably seen videos of people clamoring for the new iPhone, things like that. So the Chinese consumer, I think, is still a growth story. But overall, it's just growth is being curtailed at the margin. So I, I don't think the multinationals in the U.S. are going to see major changes in demand. But uh, at the margin, you probably see higher input prices, slightly lower demand. All of those things are potential headwinds to profitability. All right, thanks so much, uh, Patrick Armstrong, there with uh, some strong insights. He's chief investment officer at Plurimi Wealth. Now, in the last uh, five minutes or so, we also have that Bloomberg headline saying that creditors are said to claim Evergrande is on the hook for a bond due on Sunday. Now, I think there was a 30-day extension. Of course, uh, we're hitting the phones to see exactly what that means, but we understand that some holders of a $260 million Jumbo Fortunes Enterprise dollar bond are forming a committee to press some of their claims and their concerns. Coming up, Leslie Vingemurie, Chatham House head of the U.S. and the Americas program, a conversation on the debt ceiling and infrastructure. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the principal room. Coming up later on today, Jim Farley, the CEO of Ford, joins Balance of Power at noon Eastern time. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines in New York with Francine Lacqua and Danny Berger in London. Let's get back to Washington, where the debt limit showdown is intensifying. Senate Republicans last night blocking a bill to suspend the debt ceiling until December 2022 and keep the government operating past September 30th. Joining us now is Les Leslie Vingemurray, Chatham House head of the U.S. and America's program. So, Leslie, the Republicans have made their move. The question is what the Democrats do next and who blinks first. That's right. And I think that the, the real concern here is, you know, first of all, getting that spending passed so that the government can stay open. They've got to do that by Thursday. But really what they'd like to do is to get bipartisan support still uh, for increasing that debt ceiling. And of course, this is, you know, something the Democrats feel that they gave to the Republicans in the past. They want to see it, um, that, that deal uh, delivered now that the Democrats uh, have, uh, have control. Um, but it's very precarious. And as we know, it's taking place alongside uh, these negotiations within the Democratic Party to get their social infrastructure uh, bill through. So, Leslie, will they be able to avert a shutdown? Uh, I think, Francine, that there, it's likely that the um, Republicans and Democrats will come together to get this the funding to keep that government going. But, of course, it might come at the price of the Democrats having to um, work on their own to lift the ceiling. That's what Mitch McConnell is saying uh, the Democrats should do. And this is clearly, you know, very live issue, uh, and they yeah. will have to make a choice as to um, whether they can really put the leverage on the Republicans to come on board uh, and give that bipartisan support to increasing the debt ceiling or whether they're just going to have to go through with, this, with the temporary spending package and, and continue to focus um, on, on increasing the debt ceiling by really incorporating it into that the social infrastructure package. That's very tricky, very complex procedurally, um, but might be uh, the next move. Leslie, I feel like in the past, 2011, 2013, you know, the markets were a lot were very worried about the debt standoff. This time, they seem to be largely ignoring it. Is there, you know, a belief in Washington and in the markets that actually they'll muddle through and get something done? I think there is. I think a lot of economists right now are sort of, you know, they're accustomed to this kind of politics in Washington, as you you dated it very well. Uh, they assume that there will be spending that that's delivered. Um, and there are so many other things that the markets are watching. I think that there is, that there is, you know, there is a belief that, that this will be resolved. In coming to agreement, one word sticks out to me, Leslie, that you mentioned, leverage. What leverage do the Democrats have that they can offer to Republicans to bring them on side? This is a really tricky question right now, not least, of course, because the Democrats are having their own internal battles over the, the nature of that $3.5 trillion package, which, of course, the moderates are less keen on some of those provisions, more keen on getting that infrastructure package through. It's possible, of course, that, um, that there could be some leverage used that, of course, the, the Senate has passed the bipartisan infrastructure bill that the House is due to vote on Thursday. Uh, so this is potentially um, one source of leverage. But the, you know, the Republicans um, are very clear. They'd like to use this despite, again, despite the fact yeah. that they've had the support of the Democrats in the past on getting bipartisan consensus on debt ceilings. This is, you know, very much driven uh, as we look ahead towards the politics that will surround the midterm elections. Well, I'm so glad you brought that up, Leslie, because as you rightly point out, we're talking about Democratic infighting here. We're not even just talking about Republicans versus Democrats. As we look forward into 2022, how is a party this fractious going to keep hold of control? It looks like Leslie may have not heard us there, but I think it does raise a really interesting question, Francine. As we look forward into 2022 and you see such a stark divide between the mm -hmm. moderates and the progressives, what's the Democratic Party do next? Yeah, and actually, how does Nancy Pelosi try and keep them all in line and vote in the same direction? The million-dollar question. We'll get back later to Leslie Vinger-Murray, Chatham House head of the U.S. and the Americas program. Now, coming up, we also speak to the WTO Director General, Ngozi nkonjo Iwela. It's a conversation, of course, on trade, but also the Director General has been really pushing for a vaccine across the globe. So it'll be an interesting conversation on that as well. This is Bloomberg.
This is just the first inning of a multi-year, potentially decade-long commodity super cycle. You know, it's driven by, you know, we have the, you know, the war on climate change, the war on income inequality. All of these dynamics lead to a structural rise in commodity demand against these underinvestments with this whole idea of the revenge of the old economy. You know, I like to point out in the super cycle of the 2000s, the bull market started in 03. Yeah. The energy capex didn't begin into 06, and the metals capex didn't begin to 08. So we got a long ways in front of us, and this is just the beginning. Jeff Curry there, Goldman Sachs Global Head of Commodity Research, speaking earlier on our Price of Power special. Tom Keen, client for Bloomberg Surveillance, now joins us. Tom, I know you're looking at prices in energy, but also after that Treasury move, did you have to be medicated yesterday? Yeah, well, you know, it's what it was. I mean, the auction was what it was, and we've seen the bond market. The market's today giving us even more information. It's, Monday and Tuesday have just been extraordinary this week, led by Mr. Curry's oil. I will feature in the next hour the Jeff Curry at $66 a barrel, so get out of the way and look for $80, and here we are. The Brent crude chart tells volumes, and the really important thing is our collective memory of, of well over $100 a barrel the red line off to the left side. Down we go to cheap, cheap, cheap oil. We're back and breach $80 today. And there's many looking for 100 including Francisco Blanche with uh, Francine, some huge clarity on the path to $100 a barrel by the end of next year. Yeah, and this, Tom, will actually, you know, start being a real problem, not for inflationary pressures, but really for spending power for consumers. Yeah. And it could put extra, you know, imbalances in front of central banks. No, well, certainly it does in the United States. I looked very carefully today, Francine, at a gallon of gas, and we're nowhere near crisis on a gallon of gas in America. But you can see how a 30-day moving average of what a gallon of gas costs can begin to get out and reach out towards $3.50, $3.60 a gallon that it was when uh, it was painful. I understand for you in London, that's uh, a silly number. <laughs> Tom, what's the Tom <laughs> Keen take this morning on the resignations of Kaplan and Rosengren? Uh, widely expected. I mean, it's not that I've been calling for it. We don't give opinions here, as you know. Well, Kaylee, you give opinions. I don't. <laughs> but, um, you know, it was just a matter of time, and I thought that both of them in their own ways handled it uh, with immense grace. You know, you move on, you do other things. That's all there is to it. Tom, what about the move in break-evens we've seen? I was just looking at a German five-year moving eight basis point. What is that telling you? Uh, the break-even dynamic I'm watching carefully, to be honest. I mean, I, I like what BlackRock is saying about the new nominal. And their bet, they're far more optimistic than the gloom that's out there right now. But let's remember, it's the nominal yield and then the inflation guesstimate. And that gives you the residual and the break-evens fold into that. The real yield today, negative 0.85. It's made some nice headway. I don't hear many people saying we get to zero on a real yield. I, I just don't see that yet. Tom, if you had to pick the long end, the belly, or the short end, what's the most interesting to you right now? Well, I would look at the belly and say it was too big a weekend is what I would really say. <laughs> but other than that, I, yes, I think there is dynamics in the belly. And I can say that that's where the pros look. The pros always look to the belly. And Mrs. Keene says, start working out. That's what happens. There you go. Ju kale juice, Tom. That, that's oh, kale juice. Oh, about. yeah. Kale yeah. juice. No, I'm going to stick us. with my tang. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Tom Keener, Clanker of Bloomberg uh, Surveillance. Now, this is what else we're watching. A lot going on today. And, of course, we're on uh, the Yellen and Powell testimony watch. Kaylee is. Yeah, that begins in the Senate around 10 a.m. Eastern time, Francine. They're going to be talking about the CARES Act, but the timing of this is really interesting given it is such a crucial week for fiscal policy in the U.S., both as it relates to the debt ceiling, avoiding a government shutdown, and that long-term economic spending. And I would imagine that policymakers are going to press Jerome Powell specifically on that fiscal part of the equation, and he's going to have to dodge and weave as best he can mm -hmm. around those questions, especially considering he's still trying to figure out if he's going to get reappointed to a second term, Danny. Yeah, I'm watching something that's in the same multiverse as you are, and that's the Treasury auction. Uh, a couple reasons I'm watching this. So this is a seven-year note uh, auction, about $62 billion. It's going to hit at 1 p.m. First off, this it's the dreaded seven-year. We'll recall back in February, it was a seven-year yield auction that really got markets spooked a bit after there wasn't a lot of demand. But at the same time, you had a two-year yield auction yesterday, Francine, that really seemed to ignite markets uh, and see this much higher in yields across the curve. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot going on 
everything's interlinked. I mean, the other thing yeah. we're watching, of course, is Evergrande because we have this nice Bloomberg scoop. But we're trying to figure out exactly how much exposure or how much, uh, you know, how many parties have exposure to this dollar bond that wasn't paid a couple of days ago. Now, we understand that, of course, some of the deadlines, uh, and there was one on Sunday, which is perhaps its largest debt test since regulators recently urged the company to avoid defaulting on dollar bonds. But we understand that the deadline could have a 30-day moratorium. So it's unclear exactly a lot of factions, of course, investors trying to organize themselves to also put pressure on Evergrande to be paid. But it, it kind of, you don't know the timeline of this exactly, Danny, because it could be, you know, two, three weeks that where they organize and put pressure, or it could actually take a lot shorter for this to be resolved one way or the other. Exactly. And, you know, we hear about Chinese authorities telling Evergrande to really concentrate on building mm -hmm. projects, not necessarily paying the debt. So, Kaylee, that certainly throws another wrench in this development. Prioritizing China and the people of China seems to be the story here. But the dollar bondholders, they may be left holding the bag. Yeah, we'll see. It'd be a big news if uh, indeed that's the case. More Bloomberg surveillance coming up ahead. We'll hear from Francisco Blanche, Bank of America Global Commodities and Derivatives Research Head. They'll, of course, be talking about the energy crisis. This is Bloomberg.